I have no idea what about the current situation would make you think that it's an ideal time to get into the world of pistol caliber carbines, but if you do, Aero Precision's got a pretty sweet one for you in the Aero EPC, coming up. <laughs> What's up guys, my name is John with PewPewTactical.com, your definitive source for gun reviews, gear guides, and all things that kind of look like homemade Etsy Star Wars props. Before the world ended, I would say that pistol caliber carbines had a variety or a myriad of use case scenarios that are all pretty common. For the unfamiliar, a PCC tells you exactly what it is right in the name. It's a carbine chambered in a pistol cartridge whose main selling point is going to be ease of use, as obviously a pistol round running through the silhouette of a rifle makes for some real smooth shooting, and adding that third point of contact in the form of a stock also means they're much more controllable generally than their pistol caliber pistol brethren. PCCs are pretty flexible conceptually, and can be great choices for competition shooting, home defense situations, situations, truck gun setups, or even just as a training supplement to your normal rifle motor skills, assuming your accessories don't vary too much between builds. At least if you're living in a post-scarcity pistol ammunition timeline that is certainly not this one. We've taken a look at our fair share of PCCs on the channel, especially AR9s, and much like their 223 Armalite namesake, I feel like there's a bit of a homogenization process that winds up happening with further design iterations that usually mean you have to start reaching for the most minute differences between manufacturers to really differentiate them from one another, and perhaps this phenomena is even more pronounced in the realm of direct blowback 9mm ARs. Because after all, how much is that design even capable of being changed to begin with? That being said, Aero Precision being Aero Precision, you would be correct in assuming that those small quality of life features that set this particular AR9 apart from the rest are nifty, even if they are small. While I believe complete off-the-shelf Aero EPCs are available, I started from a stripped lower and went from there, so keep that in mind. But one of the cool things right off the bat is that all of the more proprietary bits and bobs are installed by Aero at the factory, meaning that even though you've got some kind of unique approaches to certain elements on the upper and lower receivers, you as the one putting everything together are only responsible for the standard contents of an LPK. The weirder stuff's already been done for you. And when I say small features, here's what I mean. The lower receiver's got a threaded bolt catch paddle, which means you're not gonna run the risk of marring the receiver's finish with a hammer and pin like you might with a more standard pin setup. As you can probably tell from the current state of the gun in front of you, that's not something I particularly care about, but hey man, you do you, brother. The upper receiver comes pre-installed with this plate setup that provides a last round bolt hold open feature on an empty magazine, which is not as common in the world of direct blowback AR9s as you might expect. Your magazine well's got a decent sized flare to it that means you've got a much larger margin of error in your reloads than a standard unflared AR9 mag well. And here feels like an appropriate time to mention that yes indeed, Glock mags. The trigger guard itself is now simply a piece of the lower receiver that won't need to be installed separately. Additionally, Arrow's EPC-specific fire control group utilizes hardened trigger pins to help offset the sort of brutal by comparison wear and tear of a direct blowback system, but I think you kind of get the point. While all of the above features are indeed cool, don't get me wrong, I hope you kind of get what I mean that all of those things put together 
don't really feel like enough meat on the bone to really base an entire substantial review around, and I always try to be as real as possible with you guys, so that's my real ass real take. But that has no real reflection on Arrow, that's again just kind of the nature of AR9s as platforms. They're a little bit of a dead end if your main goal is to go in and try and revolutionize the way that they work. You're not going to do that. With all of that being said, I think it's probably obvious that I've changed more than a few things here, so it probably makes the most sense to tell you about the gun in its stock configuration, and then tell you about the tweaks I've made and why. Right up front, you've got a VG6 Gamma 9mm muzzle brake on Arrow's own straight profile chrome molly vanadium 9mm EPC barrel with a 1 in 10 twist, all riding within a 15 inch Arrow Atlas R1 M-Lock handguard. The R1 works well enough, but at this point I think I'm pretty sold on the idea of never going back to a handguard with rails along the top of it, save for a tiny bit up front for PEC units or lasers or whatever, as I can't honestly ever think of a reason I'd mount anything in the area between the barrel nut and the front sight that wouldn't be better off somewhere else. But that's obviously just personal preference, and it comes with a caveat, but more on that later. It just so happened that our editor David had an Atlas S1 lying around that he was open to trading, so that's what we did. As you can see, the S1 deletes all of the unnecessary pick rail space up top and instead gives you some ridges and handholds for a more comfortable grip if you're prone to C-clamping your GAT up front. And I personally think it both looks and feels much better than its railed alternative. The caveat that I was talking about, however, comes in the form of not being able to mount anything to the top of the rail, which, again, that's kind of what I wanted, but going into it, I had assumed that these lightning cuts that appear at 45 degree angles all over the handguard were M-Lock compatible, and they're not, even though they are kind of vaguely M-Lock reminiscent or adjacent. So you've really only got the M-Lock slots at the three, six, and nine o'clock positions to mount any of your accessories to. And again, it's not a huge deal, but when it comes to things like mounting tape switches or pressure pads or anything like that, you kind of usually want those a little bit higher up, especially if you see clamp stuff just feels a little bit more natural. Also, a small shout out for Arrow's self-ratcheting screw, handguard system, locking mechanism thing, as it makes swapping out the handguard or donning and doffing it for, say, painting, quite the breeze. A little bit further back and you're on to the receiver itself. And outside of the smallish stuff I covered a second ago, another standout for me is the magazine release. It's a longer tab looking thing which rocks back and forth by way of a pin connecting it to your lower about three quarters of the way back. And this feels like it allows for much better leverage on the paddle portion than on a standard AR mag release, as you're rolling that entire paddle around that pin to the rear rather than pushing directly inwards. Mags drop free easily and the paddle winds up being the natural resting place for your index finger when it's not inside the trigger guard. Thumbs up in my book. We've got a Strike Industries fin grip just aft of the magazine release and here's the part where the more feeble among you are going to screech uncontrollably at the sight of it and honestly, just miss me with it. Don't y'all, don't y'all ever get tired of being so predictable? Boring? The grip does its job and it feels okay. No real complaints here, and when you're used to fins, you barely notice them at all. But obviously, if you're running a compliant setup like this, it makes sense to invest in an ambi safety, which I haven't done quite yet. I do appreciate that the arrow lowers got some sleek fire selector indicators that are going to look great with short throw 45 degree levers whenever I get around to doing that. The stock arrow EPC LPK trigger is actually pretty damn nice and features some real short take up before a pretty obvious wall, a clean break, and one hell of a big thunk indicating a good reset. We've got one of Arrow's oversized charging handles in the back, which features some larger angled grabby bits that simultaneously make sure you've got a bit more of an aggressive purchase on the charging handle while providing just a bit more material to drive to the rear when you really need to get that bolt open. Perhaps not entirely necessary in normal circumstances, but we've got some weirdness going on in the back that actually makes that extra bit of leverage pretty relevant, but more on that in a second. The entire kit shipped with a Magpul carbine stock, which I have no real substantial complaints with, but instead, I figured something more minimalist and slimmer in profile would match the overall aesthetic of the gun much better with the direction I wound up taking it. And as such, it's been replaced with an MFT Battle Link stock that, side note, are apparently out of production and kind of a bitch to track down at the moment, so glad I was able to find one. 
For me personally, especially on a 16 inch nine millimeter carbine, I don't particularly see the point in running a stock with those crane styled side saddles for extra batteries or snacks or whatever it is that you put in a stock. And they tend to be obnoxious to try and get a decent cheek weld with. So low pro we go. Lastly, the folks at Kinshot were nice enough to send us another drop-in hydraulic buffer to play with, which you might remember we were pretty big fans of if you watched our What Would Stoner Do rifle build from a while back. We'll leave the science to the science wizards, but essentially the Kinshot operates by providing additional recoil reduction at the buffer's rearmost position of travel, which really takes the sharpness out of any felt recoil when firing and provides for a much smoother shooting experience overall, especially for the sometimes violent world of direct blowback guns even when they're only chambered in 9mm. I went a slightly different route with my paint choices this time around, obviously, as I figured I've already got one kind of super serious try-hard paint job on my normal AR at home. Let's do something a little fun, a little bit weird. Let's get a little bit, let's get a little bit wacky, y'all. I've had a few cans of Montana 94 laying around from a previous project and decided to put them to use, alternating shades of gray where it felt aesthetically appropriate to do so and then covering the entire thing in an artificial layer of simulated grime. Because apparently when left to my own devices, my natural instinct is to produce guns that look like trash trucks from the future. Additionally, I took a bit of a gamble with my laser choice here, but it's worked out pretty well thus far. Originally, I really wanted to track down a Zenitco Perst IV, as they're both reasonably affordable, insanely powerful for what they are, and among the smallest lamb units on the market right now. And given the overall slim and sleek vibe I'm kind of going for here, it felt appropriate to try and avoid having an enormous Death Star on the front of the gun. Eventually, while digging for any stateside Perst units, I ran across a company from Hong Kong producing clones of the US military's replacement for the PEC-15. The NGAL, NGAL, Next Generation Aiming Laser, whatever you want to call it, it sort of fits that lower profile goal I was already going for. Now, huge disclaimer here, this thing is not rated for any kind of recoil, nor is it advertised as being rated for any kind of recoil. It's essentially just a very high powered, kind of expensive toy. But I figured, what the hell, I'll pick one up and see how it does. Anecdotally, I've seen online a couple different stories of guys using them on their ARs with no apparent problems. A direct blowback 9mm is probably going to be a little bit more violent, a little bit harsher on all of the, I don't know, dubious Hong Kong electronics inside of it, but Considering I now had a high-powered cat toy in the shape of an NGAL mounted to my PCC, it made sense to use that as an excuse to grab an Arasaka 300 series scout light with a Malkoff E1HT head, mounted to an Arasaka M-Lock offset scout mount to get the entire thing up into that kind of one o'clock position that is sort of my go-to, and the light's controlled by a mod light mod button on an M-Lock mount. Cable management is handled with some clever tucking and the addition of a Strike Industries bang band that keeps everything in place, while also including a small M-Lock compatible rubber tab that inserts into the handguard to prevent rotation. Overall, it works pretty well, but I kind of get the sense that maybe they're designed for girthier handguards, as you probably can't tell from there, but it feels like there's just enough tension to kind of keep it from moving around the way that it is. And to be fair, it's a pretty slim handguard, so can't really fault Strike for that. It works. Okay. Lastly, I've got a Magpul M-Lock handstop up front because I'm a creature of habit and enjoy keeping my support hand setups similar between my different guns. With all of that out of the way, off to the range we go. These are the official, the official hands of the range. First impressions are something along the lines of, hot damn, this thing shoots really smooth. The combination of that VG6 break up front and the Kinshot hydraulic buffer in the rear makes for an incredibly pleasant experience throwing rounds down range. And while yes, it's 9mm and PCC recoil is plenty manageable on its own, there's just something really special feeling about controlled mag dumps with almost zero felt recoil. Kind of more like a rubbery thump than anything else if that makes any kind of sense. Performance wise, it's about exactly what you'd expect. A nicer quality PCC that runs pretty damn well and puts your lead where it needs to go. We didn't bother papering the gun because the idea of shooting 9mm groups seems a little bit silly, but we had no issues running our pistol rack or punching out to our slightly further steel targets, nor would you really expect there to be any. 
Reloads felt smooth with the assistance of that flared magazine well, and the bolt hold open feature works quite well also, meaning you've got a real clear, obvious indicator of when the gun's empty, as well as allowing you to skip manipulating the charging handle during reloads. However, one minor thing caused by the interplay between the kin shot buffer and the bolt hold open is that it can be a tiny bit obnoxious to get the bolt locked open manually, as you're working against that beefier hydraulic buffer weight to get the bolt far enough back to engage. Not a huge issue by any means, but it definitely meant that the flared arms on our oversized charging handle and the additional leverage they provide came in handy. A sort of ephemeral issue we encountered a couple of times, oh? however, was oh? a failure to feed <laughs> wherein it appeared that our cartridge had gotten smashed up against the feed ramp with such force that it jammed the projectile down into the casing itself, which is kind of wild. Hmm. There didn't appear to be anything specific that caused this, and it occurred probably two or three times in close to 600 rounds total, so it unfortunately remains a bit of a mystery, and it could be anything from a bad batch of ammo, even though we were just running normal Blazer 115, issues with our mags, or even issues with the hydraulic buffer. We're not really sure. Just be aware that it occurred, and underscores the fact that it's always a good idea to inspect rounds that failed to feed for damage, lest you wind up cycling a damaged cartridge back through the gun, perhaps to less stellar results. Considering I threw down some dough for some silly nighttime gadgets, we stayed out in the desert on a gorgeous night with some brilliant lunar illumination to get the laser unit all dialed in. And this, of all places, is where the Arrow EPC really shined for me personally. I went in with no real expectations that the NCAL would actually work, or not just detonate upon a first use, but while waiting for the sun to go down, I took the time to get the unit's visible laser zeroed to the SIG Romeo's red dot, giving me eh, about a 50 yard impromptu minute of bad guys zero that also tuned the IR laser to that same POI, as they're slaved together. While the NGAL's IR flood is pretty damn wacky, the lasers worked pretty damn well. And point shooting the EPC in the dark with the NGAL was probably the highlight of the day for me. Unfortunately, I've definitely got some kinks to iron out with the illumination setup, however. As while the Malkoff head is only rated to about 300 lumens, it's supposed to have a pretty absurd 23,000 candelas worth of throw on the target. Which in theory means that it should outclass most surefire scout lights in illumination on the target at 100 yards. Given what this gun is, that seemed like a perfect choice, as I can't really imagine a situation in which I'd ever really be shooting past that with a 9mm AR. But alas, I think something kind of fucky is going on with my tail cap, as actual illumination was surprisingly subpar. The tail cap that's on there is just a completely random surefire style tail cap that may have manifested itself in my gear locker because I don't actually remember ever purchasing one like this. And that could well be the culprit, and it might be that the unit requires an actual surefire tail cap to function properly, but I'll have to sort all of that out in the future. So where does all of that leave us? I actually had a blast with the Arrow EPC, even if obviously a good chunk of that was the fun related to tricking it out, painting it, and mounting dubious Chinese laser units to it. While we did have a few weird malfunctions in the process of testing the EPC, I can't really firmly lay blame on the gun itself, as a variety of components have been swapped out that just might not play nicely with one another. And even still, they're not really too far out of the realm of your standard occasional failures to feed to really be too notable. If you're currently in the market for a pistol caliber AR for either plinking, home defense, or really any other application you can think of, I think it probably makes sense to check the EPC out, as it's small quality of life improvements make it decently more attractive than some of its lesser competitors, and Arrow's a brand that's essentially synonymous with high quality and mostly reasonable prices, even if that means potentially waiting a while to snag one considering how often most sought after firearms go in and out of stock these days. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the content, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification thing. Check the description down below for links to shirts. You can buy shirts from us that feature our logo and branding that you can put on your body. Stop buying NFTs. They're dumb. You're destroying the environment. Buy shirts instead. My name is John with Pew Pew Tactical. We'll see you next time.